You know, a lot of people on the autism spectrum, they think in pictures. They think in sounds. You know, and there are some people that are nonverbal. They call them low functioning. But it turns out that when they're given a computer, they can learn how to type, and, and they're typing totally independently. Some people don't want to believe that. I was just on the phone today with a mom. Uh, she was very frustrated that some of the therapists didn't want to believe that her son actually could type. And nobody was touching him, and he was typing. But there's a world in, in animals and also in autism where you get away from thinking in words. You've got to start thinking in sensory. That's what you've got to do. Well, an animal's world is based on sound, sight, touch, smell, touch. Think about how much information a dog gets off a local fire hydrant. He knows who's been there, how long ago they were there, um, you know, are they friend or foe, is there anybody around to breed. There's a lot of information on the fire hydrant. Now, just to show that there is a whole other world sort of underneath language, when Van Gogh painted Starry Night, he didn't realize that he was painting statistical models, mathematical models of turbulence in this famous painting. But some mathematicians analyzed this. You know, ma mathematical and kind of pattern thinking, that sometimes is hidden underneath verbal language. And some of the kids that are very, very good at math, they're actually horrible at reading. I just um, was uh, back in uh, Connecticut, and I met a little 10-year-old boy that was in, they could do, you could do college calculus. I said, well, you need to let him do college calculus. But he's going to need special ed in reading. You know, skills tend to be uneven. And another indicator that underneath verbal language in the brain, it may be art, is there's a type of Alzheimer's called frontal temporal lobe dementia, where the language parts of the brain get wrecked, and then art talent comes out of a guy that used to st install stereos in cars. A guy that had no previous interest in art. Sensory-based thinking. Now, the thing about the autistic mind and the animal mind is they're both into details. They notice details first. Okay, if you had a horse that wasn't used to this arena, he might be afraid of a, like a shiny, sparkly off this water bottle. You know, now if he walks by that every day, he's going to get used to it. But something that sort of looks out of place. We well, got big letters here, and we got them, and they're made out of little letters. And if you ask the person to identify either the big letters or the little letters, the autistic person picks out the little letters quicker. Autistic thinking is all details. It also goes specific to general. Concepts and general principles are made out of specific examples. And get into that a little bit later. Normal human thinking that's verbally based is top down. Have a concept. And one of the things I find when we're trying to work on animal behavior problems or, you know, any kind of behavior problems, they'll say stuff like, well, my horse is nuts. Or, uh, my kid's got a behavior problem in the classroom. Well, I don't know what a behavior problem in the classroom is. That's being way too generalized. They have absolutely no, what, no idea what that is. He may be like talking out of turn, or maybe he's punching holes in the wall. You know, those would both be a behavior problem in the classroom. Now, some brain scan research done by Dr. Nancy Minshew at the University of Pittsburgh showed that the normal mind drops out the details. And the autistic and the Asperger mind tends to pick up the details. Okay, and so in my early work with cattle, um, I went out to the feed yards and I watched cattle going through the veterinary chute, and I noticed they were afraid of a lot of things that people tended to not notice. At this particular feed yard, the cattle wouldn't go into the veterinary building, and the reason why was because the flag was there flapping. They wanted to change the whole work area. All they needed to do was move the flag. You know, it's obvious. Or there might be a chain hanging down in a chute. And I've been doing talks on cattle handling for years, but I still have to show this stupid slide of a chain hanging down in a chute because people don't take it out. They don't notice the details. Look at how that animal's looking right at that sunbeam. You know, if he walked over that every day, if a cow walked over that every day going to the milking parlor, they wouldn't notice it. But you have an animal who hasn't been there before, they notice it. I always get asked on slaughtering, do they know they're going to get slaughtered? And I found that they behave the same way at the slaughterhouse as they did in the veterinary chute. And if they knew they were going to get slaughtered, they ought to be behaving a whole lot worse at the slaughterhouse. I'd get down in the chutes and see what they're seeing. 
Look at the shadows you can see there. You'll see people through the side of the chute. Maybe see cars going by. What are they seeing? I have to teach people how to look at detail. One of the ways I do that is I just give them checklists. But when I first started getting down into the chutes, see what cattle were seeing, people thought that was just crazy. They just um, thought that they just didn't get it. Watch your ear radar on horses. Horses' ears work independently. Zebra and the horse have an ear on each other, and the other ear's on me taking a picture. And when they get upset or scared, they put the ears back. And yes, animals do have emotions. Unfortunately, my book, Animals Make Us Human, is not here tonight. And, um, and it talks about animal emotions. And yes, they definitely have them. They have fear. They have rage. They have separation anxiety. That's when you take mom away from baby. And that's a separate emotional system from fear. That's been scientifically documented. And then they also have seeking. Because, OK, that flag scares a cattle when you try to force them ne next to it. But if I took a flag and I put it out in the middle of the field, the horses are going to go up to it. See, the thing about something new is it's attractive when the animal can voluntarily approach. But it's scary. If the horse was tied up and then he just shoved flags in his face, that's going to be scary. Novelty is both scary and attractive. Attractive when they voluntarily approach, scary if they're in a confined area and it's shoved in their face. Now, I literally have pictures in my head. You know, it's like having movie reels in my head. This is how I think. Now, I realized that my thinking was different when I wrote Thinking in Pictures, one of my earlier books. When I started asking people about church steeples, and I was shocked to find out the way that they visualized them was different than the way I visualized them. Most people, I found, just saw a generalized generic steeple when I said think about a church steeple. I only see specific ones, and I can tell you exactly where they're located. Visual thinking is a continuum. Also, there's many people that are non-autistic that also are a visual thinker, but it's a continuum. But I was really shocked to find out that people got this generalized thing. And some people that were really verbal just got a stick figure like this. And I found a few people where there's no picture at all. Now, if I ask you to walk through your house, most people can do that. But I'm asking you something that you see every day that you don't pay that much attention to. Meaning if you went to the church, you probably didn't pay much attention to it. You know, they, um, and I found a few people that cannot visualize their own house or their own car, okay, like sitting here right now. It's rare, but I've found a few. I see only specific steeples. You see, my concept of what a steeple is is based on a whole lot of specific pictures put in the steeple file folder. You see, autism thinking is what's called bottom-up thinking. Animal thinking is also bottom-up thinking. You take specific examples and you put it in the church steeple file folder. You know, um, if you want to teach a kid not to run across the street, if you just taught him at, to, at school not to run across the street, he might not obey the rule at home or at the library or here at the horse place. You've got to teach him not to run across the street in many, many, many different places. Okay, I'm going to show you now when I say think about a church steeple, how they flash into my mind. And I'm going to click them up just about the speed that my mind clicks them up. OK, childhood one, local ones, famous ones, more famous ones, another famous one, another famous one. They come up just about that fast. Well, the thing is, being a visual thinker really helped me in my work designing livestock facilities. I could test run equipment in my head. I didn't even know if that was a special skill. I thought everybody could test run equipment in their head. Now, when the kids get to around, around third or fourth grade, if they're going to have a special skill, you'll see it. And here's what, uh, here's what a nine-year-old drew in perspective. We've got to work on building up the area of strength. These kids get fixations. He likes dinosaurs. Let's teach reading with dinosaurs. Teach math with dinosaurs. You want to, and then you want to work on 
on, the, on whatever their fixation is and figure out how can you turn it into a career. When, when they're in middle school, we've got to start thinking about what are they going to do when they grow up. We're not thinking enough about that. I just got back from the Autism Society of Connecticut meeting, and they had a Professor Gearhart there give a talk, and he showed some pretty shocking uh, stuff. One of the things he showed was uh, the number of studies done on autistic children versus autistic adults. It was like uh, 50 to 1. It's really terrible. Now, I used to joke around that I had a huge, big internet trunk line deep in my brain for, you know, like a giant graphics card. And this is tensor imaging, and it turns out that I do. And it's twice as big as the controls. And there's an even bigger one up there at the eye, you know, above my eyes. Now, another kind of mind is the pattern thinking mind. I think in photorealistic pictures, but another way of thinking is in patterns. Think chess, think origami, think mathematics, think music. That's patterns. Now, that praying mantis is made out of a single sheet of folded paper. No cutting, no scotch tape. And what you see in the background, that's the folding pattern. That's not my mind. It's the mathematical mind. Now, this is an important slide. Because I have found a lot of different quirky kids, and I'm getting really concerned about all these labels, you know, and they're going to be changing the, to the DMS-5, probably dropping out Asperger's. They're coming up, they're now going hot and heavy on labels like oppositional defiant disorder. That's going to be a really good way to mess up a kid's life. Um, aggression dysregulation disorder. And I heard the other day that a two-year-old got that diagnosis. That's a bunch of BS. A two-year-old, because he's two, is going to have emotional dysregulation. That's why it's called the terrible twos. <laughs> because the frontal cortex isn't developed enough to control the emotions. That's why a two-year-old's not very reasonable. Um, <laughs> so you get kids with a lot of different labels. And I find that people just get hung up on these labels. They're not accurate. I'm trained as a biological scientist. You know, you get a diagnosis with tuberculosis, I can tell you exactly what kind of tuberculosis they have. These labels are not accurate. ADHD is mixed up with autism all the time. But I have found when you get into the quirky kids, I'm going to just call them kids where the brain has a problem, a big umbrella label, that you can have minds like mine where they think in pictures, photorealistic pictures, and they absolutely cannot do algebra. But some of these kids can jump to geometry and trig, maybe even calculus, and they need to be allowed to do that. Then you have the pattern thinker. These are your music and math minds. These are the ones that can turn into engineers, computer programmers, all your Silicon Valley crowd, where people like me can be industrial designers, architects, graphic designers, uh, all kinds of jobs involving you know, visual thinking. And then another type, this verbal mind, is a verbal fact mind, where they know all these verbal details about their favorite subject, whatever their favorite subject is. These kids often love history. And then you have a person where the auditory system is the main way that they perceive the world because the visual system isn't working right. They can have a problem in the visual system where visual input uh, gets all distorted and they're going to hear, they're going to learn better through their ears than through their eyes. One of the things you've got to figure out when you're working with these little cats is he's someone that learns through his eyes or someone that's going to learn through his ears. But one of the things that's the same in all of them is they're all detail thinkers. And they always, almost always have uneven skills. An area where they're really bad and an area of strength. Now how do you form a concept when you just have all these details floating around in your head? Well this little boy sent me a picture of putting cats and dogs into different boxes in his brain. Sorting the detailed pictures into specific files. See, that's how bottom-up thinking works. Now, an animal will do the same thing, on the leash and off the leash. That's two different files in the dog's brain. When I'm on the leash, I protect my master, and when I'm off the leash, I can go play. The service dog knows that when the vest is on, I work, and when the vest is off, I play. And people need to keep that clear to the dog. I was at an autism meeting recently, and 
And this uh, lady took her service dog's vest off at the meeting. I go, no, 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 don't take his vest off at the meeting. You know, because you, you're going to get him confused. You need to make it very clear what you do with the vest on and the vest off. And your dog's going to stay a lot better trained if you do that. A man on a horse and a man on the ground. That's viewed as two different things by the horse. I have seen horses where they were abused by a rider. And you could do everything on the ground, shoeing, veterinary, grooming, tacking, all of that on the ground. Couldn't ride them. I've also seen just the opposite. You could ride them, but boy, you couldn't do anything on the ground. You see, fear memories in a horse are very specific. I knew a horse that was afraid of black cowboy hats, but white hats were fine. Another horse was scared to death of white saddle pads, but only if the saddle pad was naked and it had no saddle on top. That a saddle on top, then it was OK. But you see, that's a different picture. Another animal was afraid of diesel-powered equipment. If it ran with a gas engine, that was fine. But if it had a diesel-powered engine, it was scary and bad. You see, it's specific. Now, both animals and people on the autism spectrum are bottom-up thinkers and not top-down. In other words, concepts are formed by taking specific details, sorting them into different categories. I had to learn every concept by putting many specific examples in different file folders. I have a file folder for each concept. So when I was a little kid, how did I learn what good table manners was? What's bad table manners? Well, if I chewed with my mouth open, that was bad table manners. If I um, asked to the, have the serving dish passed, that was good table manners. If I ate mashed potatoes with my hands, that's bad table manners. You see, and then we'll just tell you what's good table manners, what's bad table manners. You see, it's all specific. What's rude behavior? OK, speaking out of turn, that's kind of rude. Uh, pushing and shoving is rude. Cutting in line at the movie theater is rude. Uh, you know, there's a number of other things that are rude. But I have to have specific examples of rude behavior that I put in the rude file. OK, let's teach a concept like up. The kite is up in the air. You walk up the stairs, walk up a hill. You go up in the attic, I lift up a cup, and there's a movie named Up because the house goes up. But you see, if I just did it with walk up the stairs, I would think it only applied to walk up the stairs. Also, in teaching math concepts, you need to teach it with many different objects. You count candy, you count pennies, you, to you count toy dinosaurs, you count toy horses, you count uh, pencils, pants. You know, teach fractions by cutting up fruit. You need to teach less and more. OK, this bottle, this is full. This one is about a third full. You can teach less and more. Teach subtraction. Let's say I have a five candies on a, piece of, on, a, on a table, and I eat two of them. That's 3 minus 2. OK, because I, I took 2 away. I ate them. You know, so it's, um, you know, you've got to do it, the math things, with many different objects in many different situations. Because if you just do it on a worksheet, the kid's going to think it just applies to the worksheet. He's not going to understand that it applies to a lot of things out in the world. Well, we already talked about the different um, math concepts. There's the horse that was scared to death of the black hat. Now, if I put the black hat down on the ground, then the black hat was a lot less scary. And as the black hat got closer and closer and closer to a person's head, it got more and more and more scary. Because that gets closer and closer and closer to the match in the horse's brain, the bad thing. Now, you can have a horse that's been abused with a jointed snaffle bit. And if you use a one-piece bit, he may be fine. But all snaffles he'll be afraid of. You know, the thing I found in working on all the projects I've worked on, there's a lot of different kinds of minds out there. I'm a visual thinker. I'm really good at doing certain things. I had a student one time. She was good at everything I was bad at. Perfect record keeper, keep her data straight, run the computer perfectly. But when it came to like looking at the data in a really creative way, she couldn't do it. You see, so the thing is, you need to have different kinds of minds to work together. And we need to be thinking about different kinds of minds. And one of the things the movie showed really well is how my science teacher really helped me. 
mentor teachers. How do you get some of these kids turned on that have got problems? Well, there might be a retired engineer who'd work with them, a retired programmer, maybe somebody's been laid off that would work with them. And it doesn't matter if the skills are old. What you're doing is turning the kid on. Okay, let's say he teaches the kid carburetors. I know cars don't have carburetors anymore, I know that. But okay, then you get the kid turned on about carburetors, you know, then the kid can start teaching his mentor how to do the modern stuff. But the thing that I found is, you know, teenagers don't go out and learn high level skills just by osmosis. There has to be some discipline of instruction. They don't just run off to Barnes and Noble and buy these books. It just doesn't happen. We need to help students who have kind of different kinds of minds to be successful. I just can't emphasize enough about mentors. Ted is a big uh, conference out in California, stands for technology, um, engineering, and design. And it's uh, a lot of techie people out there. And I can tell you out there, when you go out there to Silicon Valley, lots of Asperger people out there. Very, very, very successful Asperger people. And they look just like Shane in Big Bang Theory. How many people have watched Big Bang Theory? Well, you know, Shane's as Asperger as to come. But I noticed that people out in Silicon Valley, they don't like the label that much. Because one of the problems I'm seeing, especially with smart kids like Shane, is I'm seeing Shane Jr. come up to me at an autism meeting and they want to put him on disability because he's not that social. That just drives me absolutely crazy. You got to get these kids out, show them interesting stuff. And some of you guys that are nonverbal, they're taking in and learning a lot more than what you think. I think the keyboard needs to be introduced to them. Art class was my absolute salvation. You know, I want to talk now about sensory issues. I've been talking about sensory issues for 25 years. Why has it taken the scientists so long to start studying problems with sensory sensitivity? And I think part of the problem is they have a hard time imagining an alternate reality where a loud sound hurts your ears like a dentist drill, where fluorescent lights are flickering like a discotheque. Those are two of the worst things. The high-pitched sounds are the worst. Many labels have sensory processing disorder. Autism, dyslexia, learning problems, ADHD, oppositional defiant. I put that up there because I'm worried about a lot of kids are going to get chucked into that label because the schools aren't going to want to pay for services. I'm seeing a lot of bad things coming down the pike. I was just at a meeting in New York. I didn't like some of the rumblings I was hearing there. Uh, they're calling them aggression and dysregulation. You know, that's a way of, you know, getting out of services. And I think there's some political pressure on the DMS-5 committee for doing things to cut down on the amount of autism diagnoses. Uh, now, one of the problems I had as a little kid was hearing hard consonant sounds. People have auditory processing problems. They do not hear hard consonant sounds clearly. And my speech teacher had to enunciate the hard consonants. And uh, you know, if you had got an individual's blocking his ears, there's sounds that are hurting his ears. Or if every time you go to Walmart or a big supermarket, the kid's throwing a fit and screaming, you probably have very, very severe sensory issues. They're real. They're also very variable. One kid will have visual issues. Another kid will have hearing issues. Some are mono-channel. They're not able to see and hear at the same time. Another big problem in the brains with problems with many disorders, attention shifting is slow. It takes much longer to shift back and forth between two different things, and they absolutely cannot multitask. Some people, uh, when they're under fluorescent lights, when they go to read, the print will jiggle on the page. Some of these, some of these uh, kids will be labeled, or adults will be labeled dyslexia that have this problem. And people that hate fluorescent lights often have problems with reading. I am finding in a class of 35 students every semester, I find at least one that's got a visual processing problem. And if I ask them to draw a line and draw three half circles along a line like this, they cannot do it. It scribbles all over the paper. They can't see it. And then I find out that they hate driving at night. They're afraid of escalators because they can't tell how to get on and off them. And fluorescent lights flash on and off like a discotheque. Now in the future, there'll be, uh, there's some new electronic fl uh, fluorescent lights that may be okay.
but the standard 60 cycle ones, the 60 cycle ones are really, really bad. And there's some simple things that you can do for this problem. Um, one of the things you can do is try printing the work on light gray, tan, light blue, light pink. Try all the different pastel papers. Try colored overlays. Also, some are really helped with colored lenses. I've sent students off sunglass shopping. I've sent mothers out sunglass shopping. Uh, one mom had a seven-year-old that could tolerate five minutes at the local Walmart. And after she bought some pink Disneyland glasses, the child could now do an hour at the local Walmart. Now, the only advantage of getting Erlen lenses is you can get the perfect color that works the best for you. See, in your brain, you got shape, color, and motion circuits that assemble the graphics file back here inside your head. Scientists don't know how that works, but there's something wrong with those circuits. They're not working together right. And for some unknown reason that nobody understands, colored lenses sometimes work. And they sometimes work spectacularly well. And it's a simple thing you can try. A laptop computer also is the only screen that doesn't flicker. A lot of other computer screens flicker. Now, new screen technologies are coming out now. Always test it back against a laptop. Let's just open it up for a whole bunch of questions. Because I find questions more interesting than I do what I'm doing the talk. The problem with autism is it's very, very variable. Very, very variable. And these sensory problems are variable. And they range from a nuisance to completely debilitating. And I can tell you right now, my top priority for autism research would be to put a lot more research into, into treatments and understanding these sensory issues because they cut across a whole ton of different disorders. I'm sick and tired of a thousand papers on the face recognition circuits. Uh, be, you know, how, how, how are you going to be social when you can't tolerate being in a noisy restaurant? You know, let's get that fixed first. In general, high-pitched noises tend to be a lot worse. That's just kind of a general principle. But then you can have other sounds like running water, one kid will love running water. Another kid's going to run from it. Some will have body boundary problems, like if I put my hand on here, I can't tell where my hand starts and the table you know, ends. Can't figure out the body boundary. Um, uh, some people, uh, their hearing fades in and out like a bad mobile phone connection, especially when they're tired. Uh, they, um, seeing and hearing may be such a jumble that smell and touch may be the only senses that work. And this is why they're tapping and smelling everything. Because those senses still are giving in accurate information. Sleep issues. I sleep issues. I stayed up all night. And the rule was I could stay up as late as I wanted, but only the reading light could be on and had to stay in the bed and, and just read. And I would stay up really late. But, but then when the alarm clock went off the next morning, I was expected to be down for breakfast. And this is where I think my 50s upbringing really helped. There were some expectations for manners. I mean, I'm seeing too many smart kids on the spectrum go into a store and just pull merchandise off the, the, the shelf and throw it around. I, I didn't do that. I could, by the time I was six or seven, I could shop and behave in a store. You know, and then when I did something wrong, they explained it. I had a horrible time with teasing when I was in high school, and horses and riding was a refuge away from teasing. Um, I had activities where I had shared interests with other students. You know, that's where I had friends. Friends I'd ride horses with. Friends where we decorated our Brayer plastic model horses together. Uh, people that I did carpentry work with. You know, I think it's very important to get students into these specialized things like band, computer club, robotics club, you know, all these specialized things, history club, things like that. I was taught turn taking with many, many different kinds of activities. One advantage in the 50s is that things that were fun, you had to do with another person. Table hockey, that was my favorite game. But you've got to play it with somebody else. You can't play table hockey by yourself. And, and I, I had to learn how to play board games fairly, and I was a bad loser. 
And these are the sort of things where it just had to be done over and over again. No, you can't be a sore loser. No, you cannot slam the board down. That's not good sportsmanship. No, I was a rotten sport in the beginning. You know, the kid, all I always wanted to win all the time. Well, sometimes you don't always win. Well, what kind of stemming I did, I did rocking, I did dribbling sand through my hands, I did twirling things. And I had a, an hour after lunch where I was allowed to do some of that stuff. But then the rest of the time, like especially the dining room table, I was not allowed to do that. Uh, and, you know, I did the typical, you know, autistic stims. And a little bit of stimming helps the kid to calm down. But if you stimmed all day, they'd tune out the world and their mind is not going to develop. And one of the things that's good in horseback riding is you got rhythm and you got balancing in the same activity. And those two activities can often be really, really good for the nervous system. But yeah, I had trouble learning to talk. My, you know, my speech came in, my speech came in slowly, and I was I could talk at four, but I probably wasn't fully a fully fluent fast talker until five. My speech came in slowly, stressed. You know, I'd say like, bah for ball, bro for broken, bro for broken. See, I wasn't hearing hard consonants. Well, I had a, I had a um, sister who was a year and a half younger, and I think it was hard for her, especially when we were in the same, um, you know, middle school together. and. Yeah, and having a weird older sister, that was not easy. We were in the same elementary school together. And then I had another sister and brother that were five and six years younger. I don't think it affected them anywhere near as much because we were never in the same school together. Well, when I was a little kid, I always liked making things. I built all kinds of things. I remember making an aircraft carrier out of a shingle, and I cut little sailors out of adhesive tape and stuck them on the deck. I, I just always liked to make things. And that was encouraged. And those were activities that I was able to do with other children. So that was really a good thing, you know, making things. Well, you know, I can remember, I had to learn how to take another person's perspective. I remember one time I was chewing with my mouth open. My mother told me to shut my mouth. And I didn't understand why chewing with the mouth open was bad. And then one day I came home from school and I said, well, when Billy chews with his mouth open, or he uh, mixes mess ketchup, mustard, mashed potatoes together in equal proportions. It just makes me sick. And I think Billy's mouth looks like the inside of a garbage truck. And Mother said to me, well, when you chew with your mouth open, it looks like the inside of a garbage truck. Then I understood how chewing with my mouth open grossed out somebody else. But you see, and that's part of learning empathy. You've got to learn how to take the perspective of, of somebody else. Animals can have things like behaviors they get rewarded for. Yeah, so there's certain behaviors animals get rewarded for. There are certain behaviors that animals like to do. Like if you put a flag out in the middle of the pasture, they're going to go look at it and explore it because seeking is positive. There are certain things that scare them. Things that scare them are going to be bad. Things that hurt are bad, you know, in the animal's mind. You know, then you have behaviors that I, I remember when I was seven years old, I stole a toy fire engine from another kid's birthday party. And I brought it home, and mother, I lied to mother and told her it was a party favor. And she said, you're going to have to take that back to, back, you know, you can't, you know, be stealing the fire engine. She said, how would you like it if, he, if Sandy came over and he stole one of your airplanes? You know, and mother made it very plain that, you know, stealing the toy fire engine was from this other kid's birthday party, that was wrong. That was corrected right then and there. And I didn't steal anything after that. You know, because when I took it away from the other kid, now he no longer had the fire engine. She said, well, you wouldn't like it if he took some of your toys. You know, in order for me to understand it, she had to put it in, well, if he came over to, the, to your room and took one of your airplanes, you wouldn't like that. Well, what I have to do is you have to learn it by a whole bunch of specific examples. You see, everything is specific to general. A normal mind that thinks in words thinks way too vague. I had to learn, well, you see, I, then I have a, 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 a categories of rules that I came up with in high school. Well, in the 50s, you lived in Massachusetts, and that's where I was brought up. Everybody knew that the penalty for murder was the chair. 
They just took you down to Walpole and they fried you in a chair. I mean, that's what happened to you if you murdered somebody. I mean, all the kids knew that. They knew all, and then, you know, we'd seen the electric chair on the Superman uh, TV show. Well, we knew all about that. So you don't kill people because you're going to go to Walpole and they're going to fry you. <laughs> and and uh, that doesn't sound very nice, but I... Uh, and then other things like you don't hurt somebody else. Well, one time when I was very, very young, when I was like three, I pulled the puppy's ear and mother went <laughs> like that to me. She said, well, that's how the dog feels. Never did it again. Never, never, never did it again. I was like three years old. I don't even remember doing that, but I was a real little tiny kid. Then I never did it again because now I knew how the puppy, I don't even remember that dog as a puppy. I only remember him as an adult dog. But I, you know, things just basically taught with a whole lot of specific examples. You know, you share your toys because you'd want another, you know, if you want to like, because you like to get another kid to share his toys with you. It's sort of teaching the golden rule, one specific example at a time. Treat others the way you want to be treated. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't make the connection about my visual thinking fully until I wrote Thinking in Pictures in the mid-90s. And when I asked my church steeple question, and when I asked my church steeple question, that was like a revelation of seeing how my thinking was different. Because before I asked people, visualize your own house and your own car. And of course, most people could do that. But you ask factory, you know, cruise ship, okay, something you're less familiar with. Then the images got, get vague. And the thing that's good about the church steeple is everybody sees them. And I think it's very important to get these kids that don't want to be hugged to tolerate being hugged. You're not going to get scratchy clothes against my skin, but it is, uh, it's a lot easier to desensitize to deep pressure. And you need to be, work on that. I think it helps to give feelings of empathy. And Oh, aggression, yes. Uh, when I got into puberty and kids teased me, I responded by fighting. I was kicked out of ninth grade for throwing a book at a girl that teased me. And I went away to the special boarding school, and that's shown the movie very nicely. And then I got another fist fights, and they took horseback riding away for two weeks. And I switched from anger to crying. I couldn't control emotion. So I switched the, from, from an emotion that wouldn't make me lose horseback riding. And I've had some moms say to me, well, my teenage boy's a crybaby. I don't like that. I say, look, crybabies can hold employment. Crybabies don't go to jail. There's problems with top-down control of emotion because the frontal cortex is not working as well. You know, you can cry out behind the barn somewhere down the basement or something, you know, in the broom closet. And I had a lot of social problems at the meat plants, and I had places I'd go hide, cattle catwalk, uh, electrical rooms, uh, things like that. And if I had stayed with the aggression stuff, I wouldn't have had any career. You know, like if I get mad at the computer now, I don't throw it. I just start crying. <laughs> and that's a better way to go than aggression. Good. You see, a good teacher has to be gently insistent. If you don't push it all, there's no progress. Well, we've got to work on getting them out and doing more stuff. And a video game playing, that needs to be limited to an hour a day.